time, Vicky Asakura. The two dolls that I brought are dolls that were made by my paternal grandmother, Seki Nishimura Kuniyuki, while she was at Minidoka. Um, my understanding is probably my grandmother at the time would have been in maybe her 50s while she was incarcerated, uh, having worked uh, hard during her time as an immigrant in this country, I am told that probably while at camp, unfortunately, was the first time that she actually had free time to uh, partake in more leisurely activities and cultural activities such as doll making. It's my understanding that she learned how to make dolls from Mrs. Kokita, who is well known for her doll making skills in this area. The hair of the doll appears to be made from embroidery thread and the hands look like they're pieces of paper rolled together to form fingers so it's interesting how people were very creative when they uh, lacked the traditional materials of, of making dolls. This particular doll is wearing um, a kimono and I don't know where the fabric came from but I imagine that people did have fabric and use them to make kimonos. And then the second doll is a it represents a girl, and you can tell by the hairstyle, and she also was dressed in a kimono, and her obi is one that reflects that of a younger person. My grandmother, Seki, um, came to the United States prior to 1900, and um, came from Yamaguchi-ken, Oshima-gun. Oshima is an island in the Inland Sea off the, the mainland of Japan, and in a small town called Hikuma. Her family had an orchard of Nikans and her rural background also influenced her interests when she was here, you know, doing things like fishing and uh, matsutake tori, as well as taking on some of the more cultural aspects like doll making. And she had five children, two other sons, one of which is my father, who was the eldest, was raised here. and. Oh, her husband was Koju Kuniyuki. Koju was also from Yamaguchi-ken, Oshima-gun, but a place called Agenosho. She came as a picture bride. My understanding is the, the story is that when the women arrived on the boat, my grandpa was eyeing another woman who was much prettier, but ended up with Seki. But apparently she was a good cook, and uh, I think that was a bonus for him. I don't know if there was any particular training. I don't believe that um, she had any specific training in that because when she came, I think after coming here, they spent a lot of time raising children or um, working. They've had a number of businesses, a barber shop, they had a hotel. They had the Wilshire Hotel on 7th and Virginia, which they owned just immediately before incarceration. So in a hotel business, her job probably was to clean the rooms and do other kinds of tasks to support the family business. Um, by the time I was old enough to understand, she was probably in her 60s and 70s and her English was limited so words were probably a mixture of Japanese and English and when I was younger we didn't necessarily have an interest in things of this sort and People didn't really talk that much about their experience while being incarcerated at Menadoka, and it wasn't until after the redress movement that you began to hear more stories. So we had an apartment that we grew up in after World War II, and so they lived in the unit across from us, so we saw them frequently. Uh, the dolls were at their house. They had a glass cabinet that um, where the dolls were, and it's a vivid memory still of seeing them in that cabinet. I actually learned it from a classmate of mine whose family had also been incarcerated. My parents did not go to camp. My father was drafted in the, into the 442nd despite his age. He was probably a lot older than the typical draftee at the time. And my mother and her family went to Detroit because there was an opportunity to leave the area um, after um, things, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. They had the Wilshire Hotel in 7th and Virginia, and my mother was working for a lawyer, a Caucasian lawyer who lived um, in the University District, and this Mr. Hutchinson, I believe, was his name, 
uh, help them to sell the hotel at a fair market value, mm -hmm. whereas other people were you know, getting pennies on the dollar. So that's the only story that I know, and I think many of their belongings were stored with the family because we have a lot of items that were pre-World War II that are still in the family. They came back to Seattle after the war. Um, our family lived at first with uh, my dad's cousin in their where they lived on Spruce Street, and then we bought an apartment on 13th and Washington where we eventually lived. And they also had a restaurant called Tad's Cafe. You know, she might have helped out, but um, I know my grandpa used to go there and sit in the back booth. I'm not sure what he did. But I think at that point after the war, they were pretty much retired. And mm. my grandma, I remember, would always be crocheting. No, I never saw her doing any kind of doll making. Uh, the only other thing that I remember is going to Bonadotti with her and going to Japanese movies with her. So the only other thing that I've heard more recently is that um, she was one of several Issei ladies that uh, brewed sake in their homes. And I was told that she was one of, her sake was one of the better sake that was made. Well, I think they continued to make it while I was growing up, but we didn't know what it was. So it was only like about 10 years ago that somebody mentioned that and my sister and brother and I found out. I guess I have an interest in Japanese items. My degree is in Japanese history for one, and I also collected a lot of Japanese things. I guess it's important that one that people were there um, pretty idle in a barren desert and that Japanese were very innovative and creative in seeing all the things that were made while they were in camp, but also how you know, the culture lived on despite attempts of the American government to try to squash um, the continuation of many cultural things because it was identified as being um, connected to the quote-unquote enemy of the time. And it re represents a dark period in our history, but at the same time, it's amazing all of the wonderful items that were created. Well, one was the feeling of awe and amazement of all of the creativity and how people were able to make things out of pretty much nothing. Um, I'm told that some of these pieces of furniture were made from, you know, fruit, produce crates, and how, you know, people were able to take driftwood and polish them and make them items of art, as well as, you know, just seeing, I think, a tray that had a lot of inlay wood designs, and also some of the artwork that was done in camp portraying daily life, and of course, you know, it just saddens me and angers me to see, you know, how the U.S. government and the mainstream profited from you know, the land and the businesses that were owned by Japanese Americans during that time. And how they survived and rebuilt the community. I'm not sure. I can't really speak for my grandmother because we've never had conversation around mm -hmm. this type of thing. However, I think that it was an expression of her culture and her still feeling Japanese and because you can't really take that away, but it's always nice to have a memory that can be passed down of something that was made even though she's no longer with us. I think how do you let people know the suffering that occurred mm -hmm. about the 120,000 Japanese who lost their homes, lost their businesses, and lost thousands of dollars of, you know, resources and you know, even though there were reparations made, how many years later, more than half of the people who suffered were no longer with us. And I think it has to do with the injustices that still continue to, uh, the oppression that continues to occur against people of color, whether it's the Muslim community or others, whenever there's this fear of a certain ethnic group becoming too strong or a fear of losing um, one's place or position within the current power structure of this country. And even with our current president, a lot of attacks being made on him and still for, you know, people still seeing him as African American and not as the president. Yeah, so maybe somehow in having the exhibit, 
you know, in, in Asian culture, there's always the yin and the yang. So the one side is the positive, the cultural um, art that emerged, but also there needs to be something with some data around, you know, the the loss of wealth, the loss of um, property, and I know that I read somewhere that at the time of incarceration in California, Japanese Americans had almost 50% of the produce market, and after the war, what happened to that? I mean, it takes years to regain that kind of thing, and a lot of the times people don't go back to where they were before because, you know, it's 10 years later. And so how do you show that to alongside so that there is the understanding of what happened. What I've started to do is to, you know, put together little poster things of some of the pictures. I did a family tree so that people start seeing that. I think our Seattle relatives are very progressive and aware. I sense that relatives living in other areas may not be as uh, progressive in understanding the oppression and uh, the experiences that people have had over, you know, 40 some years ago. Yeah, it's really a shame though because most Issei did not have the opportunity to communicate with their grandchildren because of language and and also because of our age at the time that they were living and by the time we were adults they were all gone.